Hello, Zibby. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It's a pleasure. Oh, well, I have to tell you that I grew up with your books all over my house and I called my dad and I was like, dad, guess who I'm interviewing? And he was like, oh, those are amazing. I read like he read almost all your books and thought they were just fast paced and thrilling and amazing. And I feel like um, now that I have your new one, I can't wait to give it to him. So I'm thrilled. <laughs> That's great. So how do you do it? How do you keep creating these new worlds and writing for year, decade after decade in such a powerful way? Like, how do you come up with all these ideas? Um, well, <laughs> um, I, I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> 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 I sit here all day and um, come up with ideas. So it's not like I'm trying to fit this in. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been my job for 45 years and and of course like all authors I was born with a vivid imagination I mean it, it, nobody becomes an author without that uh, and it's sometimes hard uh, for people to understand I mean you, you asked me the question that we're always asked where'd you get your ideas uh, and it's hard um, uh, the, the point is that they come to us all the time uh, you know when when I was a boy I was never myself. I was always a pirate or a cowboy or the captain of a spaceship. I spent my childhood pretending to be somebody else. And that's, and now I've, uh, I've spent my, most of my working life imagining stuff. Uh, and it, it comes, you know, it, it, and it's, these ideas come sometimes when you don't want them, you know, they, um, you having a nice conversation with somebody and you, you suddenly think to yourself, um, what would happen if there was an earthquake now? What would we do? Where would we go? <laughs> you know, um, so the answer is they come easily. Of course, the trick is um, the more difficult thing is to share them with people. And that's important uh, you know, that's, a, that's a, the craft, that's the skill of what we do, uh, to write things down in such a way that when, when people are reading them, they can enter into what we've imagined and it will be vivid for them and they'll care about it. Wow. And so how do you do that? <laughs> how do you hone, how did you hone your craft? Like when you started at the very beginning of your career and you tried doing this, did it come out like this? Like, do you feel yourself getting better over time? Did it all come naturally or did you have other tricks and tools in your toolbox that, that made it what it is today? Well, I think um, uh, for all authors, you learn nearly everything that you need to know by reading. All of us, I never met an author who wasn't a voracious reader from a very young age. I learned to read when I was four years old. Uh, and I learned, uh, I, I made my mother teach me to read because I loved stories. And I was always pestering people to read to me. I can remember this. It's my earliest memory, actually. And I, you know, both my parents, all four grandparents would read to me. I had lots of both my parents come from big families. I had lots of uncles and aunts. And, and uh, there were loads of people to read to me, and it was never enough. It was, you know, I'd say, read me another one. And they'd say, no, that's enough for today, Ken. I'd say, oh, please, please. You, know, you can imagine, can't you? Uh, and so I wanted to, desperately, desperately wanted to learn to read. And I learned to read young. And I've been doing it ever since. So, so by the time you get to your early 20s uh, and you you sit down to try and write some fiction, you know a heck of a lot. You know, you know what a sentence is and a paragraph and a chapter. You know about dialogue. You know about describing landscape and describing people because you read so much of that. Of course, it's not enough, <laughs> but it's most of what you need to know. And sometimes uh, and if, if, any, if anybody ever says to me, I'd really like to be a writer, what advice can you give me? And uh, I always say, do you read much? Uh, and 
if they say, no, not really, I say, I'm sorry. You know, you, if you want to be a concert violinist, you cannot start at the age of 21. And something similar is true of being an author. If you haven't read a few hundred novels by the time you get to your early 20s, it's too late. So that's a big thing. But, but on top of that, I mean, I, had, I did have... Uh, I could do action. I could do dialogue. Uh, there were some things I had to learn. I, I, when I started, I wrote 10 unsuccessful books, by the way, before I have the needle. So, so uh, I didn't, clearly did not, uh, even though I knew a lot, I clearly did not know enough at that <laughs> point in my life. Uh, and I had to learn, uh, I had to learn to emphasize the emotion. You know, I could do two people having, a, having an argument, quarrel. I could write their dialogue, but I wasn't good at saying how they were feeling about it. And I had to, I, that was something that I had to consciously concentrate on. Not, don't just tell the reader what happens. Tell the reader how it feels. Are they angry, indignant, scared, resentful? Uh, all of this, these emotions... Uh, because, of course, and I, know, I now know, but I had to learn it, you, for the book to be successful, the reader has to share the emotions of the characters in the story. So when a character is scared, the reader is like this. Something sad happens in the story. The, there's a tear in the reader's eye. This is a miracle, of course, because the reader knows that this, this story was made up. Follett made it up sitting in this chair, in this room. <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference, does it? If, 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 the, if the scene is well written, the fact that you know it never happened makes no difference. You still feel, if somebody's bullied in the story, you feel indignant. You want to you bang the table and say, hey, that's not fair. <laughs> so the... The emotion, the reader's emotional reaction to the story is paramount. If you can do that, uh, you've got a successful book. And if you can't do that, uh, it won't be a bestseller. It might be, you know, it might still be a good book. It might be clever, it might be witty, it might be brilliantly well written, might be informative, but it won't be a best-selling novel if if readers aren't moved emotionally by it. Interesting. So here's the whole secret. This is great. I think so. <laughs> I think that's the basic secret. Yeah. So I'm a little discouraged because only one of my four kids seems to be really into reading. And now I feel like I have no shot at having <laughs> perhaps one author among them, but that's it. <laughs> it's like that though, isn't it? You know, I've got some, uh, I've got some grandchildren who are absolutely like I, as I was, uh, fascinated by stories from a very young age and others who would rather, you know, would rather watch TV. I've got a son, actually, stepson, uh, who never read at all as a boy. Uh, and he is a very successful film editor. So, you know, all that time he spent in front of the TV, I thought he was wasting his time. I thought he should be reading a book. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it all, you know, it's, he's, he, he got to the age of 21 and he understood the grammar of television the way I understood the grammar of language. So you can't, uh, you know, it's the, it's the joy of, of, um, uh, of evolution, genetics, I suppose, isn't it? That um, your kids aren't necessarily like you. <laughs> yeah. I know. I feel that way when my kids say they want to watch TV, this and that. And I hear about people like Simone Biles, the Olympic gymnast, who would watch hour after hour of gymnastics on TV. And that's really how she was teaching herself. And then when I'm like, oh, no, 30 minutes today, I'm like, what if? What if it could be Simone Biles if I just let them watch more gymnastics or something? But anyway, you never <laughs> Um, so my husband is stepdad to my four kids, and I know he's always looking for, you know, advice or a friendly ear for other stepdads. And since you referenced your, <laughs> since you referenced your stepchildren, I was wondering what you think some of the, some of the hallmarks of success of being a good stepdad might be, so I can give him some pointers. Well, um, 
I, uh, my philosophy was, um, you don't need your stepchildren to like you, but you want them to trust you. They want, you want them to see you as the person they can go to and say, I've got a problem. You don't, you don't want to be their friend because it's not that, of course, of course they, they become hugely important in your life and you love them and they love you, but you don't try to be their friend. You don't say we're going to be pals, son, aren't we? <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's crap. But you need to have uh, the Advil, okay? Uh, oh, uh, Ken, I've got a headache. Try, try taking a couple of these and then if it doesn't go away in about half an hour we'll think again that's the kind of thing you've got to you've got to have the you've got to have the cold remedy uh you've got to have the tampons actually because you know when they're teenage girls things happen suddenly and or they or they forgot to bring any and they get, what am i going to Okay, I happen to have some in my suitcase. <laughs> that all that condoms, I'm afraid. You're the you are the one. You've got to be the go-to person when mum isn't there. Of course, they'll, they'll go to mum. You've got to be the go-to person for a problem, and you've got to be equipped for that. So anticipate, make sure that what anything that's likely to go wrong, they come to you with a problem. You're going to be able to help, and then they'll think. You know, without even thinking about you, that's how you sort of grow into the parental role with your stepchildren. It isn't about being liked, it's about being trusted. Oh no, wow. I feel like <laughs> as a mom, I'm a total failure. I don't always have all those things on, on hand. Well, certainly not the latter, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess it's good to defer that to somebody else's responsibility tree, if you will. <laughs> Wow. Um, I had a question actually about the beginning. Well, it's not even technically the book, but in the beginning of the evening in the morning, you say in memoriam EF. And I was just wondering who is EF and, and why I dedicate this book to this person? Or... Um, uh, he was my son and he died. Oh. He died uh, two years ago at the age of 49. He had leukemia. Oh, I'm so sorry. And so this is the first book that I've published since his death. And uh, so that's why it's dedicated to him. It is the worst thing that can happen to you, to have a, a child die. Uh, it's the worst, uh, you know, you expect, you know your parents are going to die. You expect that. It's sad when it happens, but it's not a shock. But when a child dies, it's an absolutely terrible thing. So, uh, and I didn't want to make a big fuss about it, but uh, I did want to dedicate a book to his memory. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's Thank you. Terrible. I'm so sorry. Did you find it hard to get back into writing or, or is it more that, you know, you're so used to doing it. This is just what you do. Was it an escape for you? Did it help? Work is an escape for me. Uh, it, it, um, uh, it's, it's, it's always been like that. If anything is going wrong in my life, then I can lose myself in the imaginary world and it's some kind of relief and consolation. Yeah. Of course, you never get over the death of a child. It's, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's with you. It's always with you. And I think, uh, and, you know, 49, I was, I was 19 when my son was born. I was a very young father. And uh, the, the, he's still in my life. I think about him every day. I think of things, I, I hear a pop song on the radio and I think he'd like that. He'd want to, he and I would, talk about what the chords were that kind of thing and um all the time all the time that happens so he's still in my life uh even though he's passed oh i'm sorry i recently lost not to compare in any way but um just grief in general from covid i recently lost my mother-in-law and step-grandmother-in-law um, or mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law, both this summer. Um, and my husband, whose mother it is, and his sister, you know, they keep reaching for their phones and trying to call her. And it's only been a couple of weeks for us, but, um, you know, the everything he thinks of, he wants to tell her. And yeah. and that's the most frustrating, not yeah. the maybe not, but it's high on the list of frustrations for him, the not being able to reach her anymore and yeah. just thinking yeah. of her constantly. And yeah. Right, but losing a child, I'm sorry. Um, do you feel like your personal 
things going on in your personal life affect, like, do you have that seep into your characters in some way? Do you channel those emotions? You said that was something you struggled with earlier, but obviously as life has progressed, you've developed more and more experiences and emotions yourself. Like, do you feel like you now infuse your characters with even more of that just because of life experience in a way? I think that does happen. I don't do it consciously. I don't consciously use things that have happened to me, but um, I, I find um, that almost without my noticing it, th th parts of my life do creep into the story. For example, when I first married Barbara, which is now, um, gosh, 35 years ago, um, I had never before been in what we now call a blended family. And so I married Barbara and she brought along with her three children, um, two teenage girls and a, a, a little boy. Uh, and that had, this was a new experience for me. And um, soon afterwards, I wrote The Pillars of the Earth, which, and Tom Builder has a blended family. And I couldn't have, it wouldn't have occurred to me to do that earlier until it had happened to me it's not that, I mean, I suppose I could have made it up, but it, it just didn't cross my mind that that would be an interesting thing to do and an interesting kind of family to have at the heart of a story. Uh, and, and once that had happened and I knew about some of the challenges and joys and, and disappointments of, of that kind of family, then I could put one in a book. So, so yes, they do. Uh, these things creep in and eventually every major thing that happens to you will, will end up in some form in a book, maybe heavily disguised and quite possibly in a form that nobody else will recognize. But you'll think to yourself as the author, you'll think to yourself, I know why that occurred to me. It's because something similar happened to me. I know that there are a lot of authors who have a lot of success at the beginning of their careers and then feel sort of this pressure to continue churning out just as great product as in the start. And sometimes that anxiety, I feel like, gets in the way, even from a big successful first book to a second book. How do you manage all of that? I mean, how do you ever like have a morning where you're like, that's it, like my talent has run out, this book's going to be terrible? Like, do you ever have that self doubt inside? Touch wood, not yet. Um, I, I um, certainly after *Ive the Needle*, my first success, I thought about that a lot, and I really wanted to have another success. And I was aware, of course, that quite a lot of people write one book, good book, and I knew that *Ive the Needle* might have been my one good book, and I really didn't want it to be the one. I wanted to, I wanted to spend my life doing this. I liked it so much. And um, so I was aware of that danger. Uh, and then Triple was a bestseller, but I thought, yeah, but people bought that because they liked Eye of the Needle. And I thought, I'll believe it if the third book is a bestseller. And the key to Rebecca was, was, was very successful. And uh, at that point, I said, okay, I am going to be a writer now for the rest of my life. That's going to be my career. It's going to be my life. And I was very glad. I was very glad because that was what I wanted. Um, there is a certain amount of pressure. Uh, I don't mind it. You know, it's good pressure. It's the thought that occurs to me if I'm tempted ever to be a bit of a slacker, to say that scene's not really very good, but it's good enough. If I'm tempted to think that. Then I think of all the people who really liked my last book and are looking forward to the next one. And I think, okay, am I going to risk disappointing them? Heck no. And so the, it makes me be more of a perfectionist than I might otherwise be. I'm never oppressed by it, but you know, I mean, I, uh, it's, it takes a lot to discourage me. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist. My inclination always is to say, oh, let's not worry about that. That'll be okay, don't worry. Uh, um, one of the kids, one of the, <laughs> with my stepchildren, they soon learned, they came to me and said, I really don't feel, I don't feel good. Um, do you, I think I should go to the doctor. I would say you'll, you'll feel better in the morning. And they, they of course would then go to Barbara 
and and she would say i'll take you to the doctor so but i my inclination was always to say no it can't be that bad it can't be that bad so um uh the 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 idea that i've got this responsibility which i do have so all those readers looking forward to the book all those people in the publishing houses all over the world you know in in all the different countries all of those people all those booksellers who who were thinking oh great we've got a ken follett to sell uh, this autumn that that'll that'll help uh, <laughs> all of those people uh to let them down uh would indeed be terrible but um what i think is uh yes that would be absolutely terrible so i, I must make sure that this is a good story wow <laughs> You, uh, what would you have done, do you think, if you hadn't, if the books hadn't taken off? What career might you have had? What was your fallback? Um, well, I, for a while, um, before I Have the Needle was published, for a while, I was a sort of, I was a sort of jobbing uh, writer. I got, a publisher would ask me to, for example, I turned a movie script into a novel for a publisher and that you know it was quite well paid uh i think i got two thousand pounds for turning capricorn one into a novel and um you know that was that would pay the bills for 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 three or four months so uh, so and i knew i could do that uh and i could do it well um and I thought, you know, I may have to go back to that, having written, I met, having, having, you know, taken my shot and written one bestseller and unable to do it anymore, then uh, I could probably still make a living as a writer, I, I thought. That, that was plan B anyway, which fortunately never got tested by reality. <laughs> <laughs> and then how involved are you? I know The Pillars of the Earth became this eight-part miniseries and everything. How involved are you in adapting your work and how much would you like to be doing that in the future? Uh, I, 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 I'm not in very closely involved. Um, they invite me to the set, which I enjoy. It's wonderful. Uh, meet the actors, uh, and uh, and of course it's you know pillars of the earth. I arrived in Budapest, <laughs> this lot, and there is this medieval English village with a half-built cathedral in the middle of it, and all all these guys with hammer and chisel pretending to build a cathedral. It was marvelous. It was absolutely marvelous. I loved it. It was a thrill. It was a real thrill. And it is that. It's a thrill. You're also very nervous. And I have had some, I've had some bad shows made out of my books, but not many, but mostly good, mostly good. And so, and I think, you know, uh, there were, there are good authors and not so good authors. There are good filmmakers and not so good filmmakers. And I've got to trust these people because one thing's for sure. I don't know as much about making a television drama as they do. So I shouldn't try and tell them what to do. I should, I should let them do their best and I should just cross my fingers. I don't um, see, I tell stories in words and they tell stories in pictures and it is a different skill. So I, that's been my practice is to, is to say great over to you and uh, I'll come and see how you're doing, but it'll just be like a social visit. I won't try and, I won't say, no, you can't do it that way. <laughs> uh, and um, by and large, that has worked for me. That's great. Are you already at work on your next book? Like how long, yes, I, how, how long, and how long do these take to write? I mean, this is like almost a thousand pages. How long does each book take you? And well, three years is the norm. Uh, and actually, um, the evening and the morning was a little bit shorter than that, but it's, uh, uh, I spend a year planning a year on the first draft and a year on the rewrite. And that's my normal timetable. Uh, some people think it's a long time. It seems a bit short to me. I, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work to get into three years. <laughs> So are you at the beginning stage of the next one or where? Are yes, you I, I've, well, I've more past that. Uh, I finished the evening and the morning about a year ago. So I've been working on a new story since then. I don't stop. Um, it, I'm not 
ready to talk about the new book yet. And that's partly because it, it may well change. You know, I, 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 what, what the story I think it is now may be something different in a year's time. Have you ever thought about writing some sort of life advice book? You have such great advice and such a wit about you and all that. Maybe you should do like a little, you know, advice to graduates or to parents. I don't know, something. I uh, I don't think that's my talent, I must tell you. <laughs> I think it might be. I think it's a hidden talent. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> when you're well, procrastinating from your main work. <laughs> well, I, you know, if... Um, uh, if the books ever, if the novels ever become unpopular and I can't sell them, then I, I may think about your advice. Okay. <laughs> you need a backup plan, you know, in the next two decades or something. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank you so much for talking to me on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and for sharing more about the evening and the morning, which I know, I'm sorry, we barely even talked about, but um, readers of yours who are huge fans will undoubtedly enjoy just as much as every other, especially because it's the prequel to one of your most popular books ever, The Pillars of the Earth. Um, so thank you. Thanks for, thanks for all the advice, even if you don't write a book about it. <laughs> well, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Yes. And uh, I hope I'll see you again. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.